in particular, uh, who I'd like to thank, Nancy Schulte, Ray Starkenberg, Barb Morrison, and uh, Lucy Wachter, and Gail Lanfear, myself. Um, and the, the Racial Justice Working Group established as a priority for this year, 2022, the following statement. Reckon with the missional and colonial history of this land, specifically Presbyterian's role, and work to build a relationship with the Native American community. So that was the statement that was written. And at this time of Lent, we hope to begin to make that effort in earnest to reckon with the past. And to that end, we bring these four speakers for this series that's entitled Place, the Land, the Church, and the People Where We Live. So for week one, we're gonna to welcome Tom Daluge, I hope I said it correctly, uh, one of our local history experts from the Doherty House. Week two will be Mark Wilson, who's both tribal vice chair of the Tribal Council for the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians and a city commissioner for the city of Traverse City. He will speak uh, to this place from an indigenous person's perspective and also discuss the current relationship between the band and Traverse City community. Week three will be Lucy, Reverend Lucy Wachter Webb and she will specifically uh, examine the doctrine of discovery and especially the Presbyterian Church's involvement in the doctrine of discovery and the colonization of this particular place. I don't know if you know that uh, term, doctrine of discovery, <clears throat> but you can learn about it in week three. Week four will be Eric Hemingway, He's the director of the Department of Repatriation, Archives and Records of the Little Traverse Band of Ottawa Indians. And Eric will speak about the boarding schools for Native Americans that were in this region. Well, I suppose that the first part of reckoning with any history is to examine past events in the context of who wrote the history. And in the introductory text of the exhibit, Our Peoples in the Smithsonian uh, Institution's um, National Museum for um, the American Indian in Washington, DC, the curators make a clear distinction between past and history. They wrote, the past never changes, but the way we understand it, learn about it, changes all the time. It's not the goal of this series of lectures to pit the history that's recorded by one group against the history recorded by another group. We should, however, recognize one thing, and that whose history becomes predominant is affected by power. Those who are the holders of power often have used it to shape the written history for their own purposes. The Our Peoples exhibit at the Smithsonian in collaboration with native tribal communities presents an entirely different version of American history. <clears throat> it counters some of the popular narratives that we might, misconceptions we might have about indigenous peoples. <clears throat> Instead, of a, a tale of decimation and disappearance. They talk about the most extraordinary history, story in human history of resilience and survival. George Erasmus, who's a respected Aboriginal uh, leader in Canada said, where common memory is lacking, where people do not share the same past, or maybe we should say history, I don't mean to substitute his words, but where we don't share the same history, there can be no real community. In that spirit, and at this time of Lent, we pray that this series may be confessional in nature. This is because we recognize that racism is at its root, a spiritual problem. Therefore, we hope to reckon with the histories that we have been told and the histories that have not been told. 
and the role of our own church's power in the mix. A warning. The series is designed that as it progresses through the first four weeks, it's going to become more challenging in nature. So stick with us. We believe that you will be blessed and hopefully inspired to action. On the back table, there's a sign-up sheet. Uh, if you would like to become a member of the Racial Justice Working Group, if you're not already so, everyone is welcome to join that. Thank you again for the gift of your presence tonight. Um, I'm going to have Lucy come forward and she'll do a land acknowledgement. Thank you. Greetings. Uh, if you live in the area, which I'm sure many, if not all of you do, you've probably heard a land acknowledgement before. Um, it has become uh, more and more a practice in our community to acknowledge the very land on which we reside and stand uh, when we go about our work and our lives together here. And so I do that, and th this practice has become and has evolved from the request of Native communities all over Turtle Island that we begin to acknowledge the very land that we live and reside and work on um, each time we gather. And so as I read these words, I invite you to feel for your feet on the ground. And remember that there is uh, a floor beneath you and then underneath that there is land, right? Soil clay from which we are formed, and of course, dust to which we will return. It is on this land that I offer these words. As we gather tonight sitting on this particular patch of land, we remember that the land has a history, a present, and a future. Long ago, before any brick was laid or concrete poured, there was likely a tree standing right where each of our feet rest now. Here, it was likely a white pine, a red pine, a hemlock. This land was covered with the forest, which was home to so much life before the trees were clear cut in just a short span of a few decades. The trees here were called green gold by the lumber barons. As the trees came down at the hands of white communities who settled on the land, the people native to this place had their land stolen and experienced ethnic cleansing and genocide. Tonight, we gather on the ancestral lands and the unceded territory of the Anishinaabek peoples. This land was stolen by a people who thought ownership of the sacred earth was theirs to take. In 1839, Peter Doherty, a Presbyterian minister, was sent to the area by the Presbyterian Board of Foreign Mission to establish a church and a school here. It was the establishment of this mission alongside the development of white settler communities in the area that in part grew the wealth for this church. Our land access, this building, the endowment, and our power locally all grow out of this history at the expense of indigenous sovereignty and indigenous life. And as a Presbyterian minister, I acknowledge and confess the harms of my spiritual ancestors for the violence that occurred in the name of our spiritual tradition as the first Christian mission in the region where I reside. Many of these truths about the past we are still learning and recovering, and this series is a part of that. I offer deep gratitude and respect for the elders past and present of the Three Fires Confederacy, the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Botawanami peoples, who call Turtle Island home. We give thanks for the stewardship of the land, for their protection of the water, for remembering that we are all part of this great home we call Earth. We offer gratitude today for the ways they continue to lead us, continue in the present day to lead us 
into right relationship with the earth and with each other. And we give thanks for the ways they continue to teach us and lead us toward collective liberation. I think we're inviting Leslie to open us with a prayer next. Is that right? And then you'll introduce our speaker. Yeah. Come on up, Leslie. As we pray together, I invite you to root down once more into your feet and into your sits bones. And then also rise up through your spine to the crown of your head, sit nice and tall so that you are sitting tall but not tense, straight but not stiff. And then I invite you to simply allow the chin to come down toward the chest and allow your eyes to close, or if it feels right to keep them open but the gaze soft. And let us open our hearts and our minds in prayer together. Gracious and holy God, you who know no boundaries, you who have created the sun and the moon and the stars and separated the sea from the dry land and called it all good, we acknowledge that we are part of your creation. And so we ask you to restore us again to this creation and to one another. We give you thanks for open minds and hearts. And so let this conversation be one of acknowledgement and learning, be one of openness and gratitude. And then in the name of your son, we pray all of these things and say together, amen. This evening, we welcome Tom Deluge. It was good to read in his bio that family and friends are what make Tom the luckiest person alive. In addition to that, Tom is retired from UPS, where he had a number of roles, the latest of which was CFO of Global Transportation. Tom and his wife, Martha, live on Old Mission Peninsula part of the year. Both here and in Georgia, he has a great list of volunteering gifts. He generously shares writing, youth work, and church work. Most notable for us this evening is his work with both Old Mission Historical Society and the Peter Doherty House. This last role is what allowed me to be aware of his knowledge. He has done extensive research and teaches Doherty House docents who then share some history of the Presbyterian missionary and the Native Americans who lived there centuries before Peter Doherty's arrival. Tom, thanks for being here. Well, thank you. Thanks for uh, having me tonight. And uh, I look forward to hopefully sharing some uh, insights with you. Um, I'm not sure what you've gotten into. Um, <laughs> uh, you're going to hear a history lesson from an accountant. And um, so let's move forward here. I uh, uh, hope that uh, I can entertain you and, and inform you a little bit. And uh, hopefully we get something out of this. I always learn something as I talk more about um, Doherty and uh, his experiences here. But what I wanted to do tonight, really in the beginning, before we talk about Doherty, is I wanted to talk a little bit about um, just what was going on in this whole antebellum period between 1830 and 1850, which is really the period that, um, encompasses the time that Doherty was beginning to look at coming to Michigan and really looked at the period of time that uh, encompassed his time in Old Mission and the move to Omina. Um, and 
it's really a fascinating time to look at what happened really throughout the United States. And so with that, if we could go to the presentation. We always cross our fingers at this point in the, in the evening. Um, if we could go to the next slide. Um, I want to give an overview really of, of some of the um, numerous economic, technological, geopolitical, religious and philosophical motives that were driving the United States between 1830 and 1850. Uh, it's a nation that's really rapidly growing and changing. Uh, it's reaching its, its place in, in the, on the world stage. And um, we're finally, as a country, we're finally free of English domination, which had really, we really hadn't gotten free of, of worrying and looking over our shoulder until really after uh, the War of 1812. And finally, after that, after the Treaty of Ghent in 1815, we kind of were able to take a, a deep breath and say, okay, we're a country and we're able to, um, to survive. But we were increasingly divided by slavery and with all this abundant land that we had west of the Appalachians and the, the uh, advent of new states coming on, there was always the question of, were those states that were going to be formed, were they going to be free or were they going to be slave? And so that was always a question. And in 1820, we had the, the Missouri Compromise, which everybody hoped was going to solve the issue, but it didn't. And it led to more compromises and it led to more turmoil. And that continued all the way up into the 1850s. Um, <clears throat> we had a strong sense of nationalism as a country, and it was... It was um, really fueled by just a, a variety of senses of a belief in ourselves that um, probably were beyond what we really, we, we probably were talking a bigger game than we probably actually had a right to be able to, to, to talk at that point. But, but we had a strong sense of nationalism. And we were confounded by this dichotomy of Western expansion and an English common law uh, definition of property rights with an Aboriginal indigenous perspective of land and the use of land and culture and uh, that was entirely foreign to what Europeans saw. And that was a collision that was going to be very difficult to solve and proved insoluble, quite frankly. If we could go to the next slide, that's really, I think, the point of your next four weeks is looking at, at, those, at those insoluble issues. At one of the heart issues on, on this whole thing was religion. And there was a tremendous amount of religious fervor in, in ferment in this whole period between 1830 and 1850 in the United States. And when you look at it, um, it caused a lot, of, a lot of change and a lot of rupturing and stretching of, of different religious orders within the United States. Um, there was the Second Great Awakening that was going on at this time. And you had the Methodists, which because they were methodical, they had circuit riders who would go out and they would visit uh, the different, um, different villages with itinerant uh, ministers. And they would preach to areas that didn't have formal churches and and uh, spread the religion. You had camp meetings. There was a camp meeting in Kentucky or West Virginia, uh, the Cane Creek meeting, I think in 1800, that drew 20,000 people. It was a huge revival. Um, and those camp meetings 
which a lot of them occurred in the border states, pulled a lot of people in. And it, when you look at uh, a lot of these camp meetings, it, it was related to, I guess, kind of a New Testament view of religion, that there was this uh, belief that there was a new millennium coming. And with this new millennium, um, people had to be brought to Christ and they had to be brought quickly because the end was possibly near and people had to accept Christ before it was too late. And so you had a lot of, of these camp meetings and you had a lot of these groups that now have become kind of mainline Protestant denominations. I grew up as the disciples of Christ. And a lot of the leaders of the early disciples of Christ, Barton Stone, Alexander Campbell, were camp revivalists who broke off from the Baptist church and formed this religion that was very, very focused on each individual having an individual relationship with Christ. That was their focus. So the Great Awakening, I think, was very important as we start thinking about missions and missionary work and how that all played out. Unitarianism had been big in the Northeast for a long time, but it birthed transcendentalism around 1820. And Emerson, who was one of the leading Unitarian leaders, was one of the leaders of transcendentalism. Um, where there is mass influxes of people, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, there is always competition for jobs. And we had a lot of Protestants filling positions in the Northeast, who in the 1840s found that their unskilled positions were now being challenged by unskilled laborers coming in from Ireland who were Catholic. And so you had Protestant Catholic disruptions that were starting to take place. Um, Baltimore, I think in 1850 was the scene of uh, the rupture of the American Baptist Convention, which has never been reconciled. You've got a Baptist Northern Convention and a Southern Convention. And that ruptured in 1850. And then you had the, the Mormons formed in upstate New York, persecuted across the United States, into Missouri, back to Nauvoo in Illinois. Brigham Young goes to England in the early 1840s. And, you know, on his mission trip, remember everybody has to go on a mission trip. And... Brigham Young comes back from his mission trip with 4,000 converts. Now he was good, but there was also mass starvation and significant upheaval between industrialization and agriculture going on in England at the time, a perfect storm. So that was part of the reason why Brigham Young was so successful in bringing back 4,000 converts, but they all came back and suddenly little Nauvoo, Illinois was the second largest town in Illinois behind Chicago. Um, in 1844, Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism is murdered in his jail cell in Carthage, Illinois. Um, there's a struggle for leadership of the, of the group. Most of the group goes with Brigham Young and they had eventually in 1846, 1847 to Utah, they end up on the Great Salt Lake, form the state of Deseret. And um, that's where the majority of the, the Mormons go, but there's a small group 
led by a guy named Joseph Strang, who Joseph Strang joins the group about a year before um, Joseph Smith is murdered. And he produces a letter after Joseph Smith is murdered that says, Joseph Strang is the um, successor, if something should happen to me, sign Joseph Smith. Well, nobody can prove that it's Joseph Smith's signature. Um, a few people go with him. They go to uh, a place in Wisconsin briefly, and then they end up in, after persecution in Wisconsin, they end up on Beaver Island. And they start off on Beaver Island, uh, cutting the timber for steamships, and they use it for wood and, and things like that. Uh, when they pretty much eliminate all the wood off of Beaver Island, they have to come up with something new. They hit on piracy. And so uh, they begin raiding ships that come through. They begin raiding towns along the shore and they become a general nuisance and almost terrorists to a lot of the people in the area. Um, uh, Strang reintroduces polygamy on the island. And unfortunately it becomes his undoing because uh, as federal marshals come to arrest him, uh, he had, I forgot to say, he had taken to anointing himself as the king of Beaver Island, the only person to ever uh, make himself royalty in the 236 year history of the United States. Um, as, as US frigates are pulling up to arrest him, a disgruntled husband shoots Strang on the wharf at Beaver Island kills him and um, there's no succession plan. Nobody has a note. <laughs> and, um, and so they are in a quandary and an amazing little fun fact here for you, the search for a successor leads to the old Mission Peninsula. And there's a guy named Lad who lives an old mission. And he had, um, left under reasonably good terms a year or two before. And um, so there's a raiding party that comes down from Beaver Island and they are coming to kidnap Lad to take him back and install him as the new king of Beaver Island. Lad finds out about this. And uh, I, think he, I think he lived on Lad Road on, on the peninsula. And um, he found out about it and uh, hid somewhere along the shoreline of West Bay uh, until the raiding party left and uh, thereby avoided becoming the king of Beaver Island. So little known fun fact that uh, ties back to uh, your area here. Um, population. Um, America was growing rapidly. Uh, every 20 years, the population was doubling. You know, we talk today about uh, a birth rate that's practically zero. America's population was growing 35% every 10 years. It grew 35% between 19 or 1830 and 1840, and again, 35% between 1840 and 1850. Um, but that growth was coming at some costs. And in New England, there were these farms that had been rather large back in the 1700s. Um, but the laws that had been used for generational wealth transfer in, um, in New England were puritanical, they were fair, Everything was distributed evenly amongst all of the uh, male heirs. And with that, 
think of this as you're going through it. If you had a reasonably big farm that was fairly successful in 1750, by 1830, you've gone through three, maybe four generations of, remember, these are big families because you have to have big families to run farms with probably four or five sons who every one of them gets a piece of the farm. So all of a sudden these farms are much, much smaller and they've lost their viability. And so now not only is the land in New England rocky, thin, the, sh the growing seasons are short, but there's not much land that you have to grow stuff on. So the farmers there are really forced to begin looking elsewhere if they want to survive. At the same time that this is going on, a very, very nascent industrial revolution is beginning to crop up along the rivers in New England, where water power is beginning to, to uh, turn, uh, what is it? Uh, no, no. Mills. Yeah, and uh, so towns like Manchester and Lowell are becoming big industrial centers. So these farm families are faced with a choice. We either go west and we find new land, or we move off the farm and we move into an industrial city and we become workers in a factory. Um, at the same time, we're getting great press outside the country. Um, there are a couple of books written, pamphlets really, uh, by early Scandinavian and Dutch um, immigrants that um, are passed back to uh, the homelands, extolling the virtues of the farmland and the, and the country that uh, is here in America. And that starts a trickle. And the trickle becomes a little bit more and a little bit more. And before long, the upper Midwest has a number of Dutch, and a number of Scandinavians starting to move here. And then um, Germany at this time in the 1840s, 1830s, is a hodgepodge of principalities, 50, 60 little principalities. And they're trying to get together. They can't. They have a civil war. Everybody's worried about the next civil war. Everybody's worried about getting called into service. Many people, like my great, great, great grandfather left because he was a draft dodger and he came here because they didn't want to fight in any more wars. So we had a number of Germans that started to come here. A lot of the Germans settled along the East Coast, but then a lot of them settled um, on the Ohio River Valley and in the Mississippi River Valley. You know, you go to Louisville, Cincinnati, St. Louis, big German towns there. Um, and then we touched on it earlier um, in 1842, uh, the potato blight hit Ireland and it decimated them for about 10 years. Millions starved and one and a half million moved here over that time. It was a trickle early. Um, and then it really started to hit about 1845 and continued through 1852 with um, a lot of uh, Irish coming here. So we had lots of people coming here from all over the, all over Europe really at this point. It was a, an amazing time. You know, we, we like to think we live in an amazing time for innovation. This is a pretty amazing time for innovation too, when you think about it. Um, if you, I would urge you if, you, if you get down on America, I would encourage you to read Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America. It will build you back up. Um, um, and 
you know, he was here, he came in 1831, he traveled around, saw so much of the country, and there were so many things that impressed him. But one of the things that really impressed him was just the ingenuity, the drive, and the, and the, the forcefulness of the American worker and the American uh, effort to succeed. Um, and another thing that really impressed him compared to his native France was the opportunity for social mobility. You know, de Tocqueville came from France where if you were born into the aristocracy, you could do no wrong. You know, you could be mediocre, but it really didn't matter. You could be mediocre and you had the money and it didn't really matter. You could be the best of class, but if you were in the bottom class, it didn't matter either. But what de Tocqueville really loved about the United States was this ability to start at the bottom and within three generations, you could make a fortune. He also liked the fact that within three generations, you could lose a fortune. He thought that was great. And he thought that was one of the things that made America an incredibly vibrant society. Uh, we talked about the Industrial Revolution in the Northeast, but then, you know, you think about America at this time, and its power is its tremendous size. For, you know, compared to Europe, Europe, every country is small and, you know, not that big. And then you come here, you know, if you've ever had European guests, they're just staggered by the size, the enormity of the United States. And it is a strength. It was a strength for us because we had all this untapped potential and all these riches that had not been really laid into yet. But we had all of this area and it was impossible to get from one place to another. It was virtually impossible to um, communicate. It was hard to get a message from one place to another. You couldn't tell who had been elected president until six weeks after the fact, because it took so long for messages to get from one place to another. Um, and if you were a farmer, it was hard for you to be able to do much other than feed yourself and feed your, the people around you. Because, well, first of all, you didn't have that big of a plot of land because your tools weren't good enough and you weren't efficient enough to be able to grow much more than what you could do to feed yourself and maybe a few friends. And basically the economy was a barter system for a large, to a large extent. Um, but in the 1820s, 1830s and 1840s, technology and innovation began to shrink the country and began to make a lot of these things that had been weaknesses, major strengths for us. Um, we can debate the Erie Canal. It, it messed up the Great Lakes, right? It, it, it allowed invasive species in, you know, we can talk about the St. Lawrence Seedway was really bad, but it all started with the, with the Erie Canal. But, um, but you really have this virtuous circle. The Erie Canal connected the Great Lakes to the Atlantic Ocean. The Michigan-Illinois Canal, when it was completed, in 1848 connected the Great Lakes to the Mississippi. And so all of a sudden you had the ability to move goods and people to the Gulf or to the Atlantic Ocean. That was pretty strategically important for the, for the country. Um, this goes back a little longer. Robert Fulton invented the steamboat in 1807. We really didn't perfect the technology until sometime in the 1820s. And it was not until the 1830s and the 1840s that we really got the benefit of fast travel on the lakes, on the, on the rivers, et cetera. Um, in 1844, 
uh, Samuel Morse, who really had a good second act with the telegraph. He'd been a, he'd been a, a portrait painter, a, a fairly notable portrait painter before he invented the telegraph. Uh, creates the telegraph, sends the first message from Baltimore to, to DC, messages, what hath God wrought? And um, he creates virtually instantaneous communication. So he invents it in 1844. The census of 1850 uh, tells us there are 33,000 miles of telegraph lines in the United States. But by the time the census is published in 1853, there are 50,000 lines of telegraph in the United States. It is growing that rapidly. And the ability to transmit information is that, is that rapid. Um, the Pennsylvania Railroad is chartered in 1846 and it's a bet. Pennsylvania Railroad gets a charter and they get told if you're able to build a railroad to Pittsburgh within, I think, two years, you get this charter. If you don't, it goes to the BNO, who is more established. Well, they built it in the time, and the Pennsylvania Railroad took off. Pretty soon, there's lines going everywhere. All states, Chicago takes off, obviously, because of its prominence. Um, by 1853, I think it is, it's almost like, um, for those of you who are investors, it's, uh, it's almost like Amazon back in 1853. You know, so many people, you know, invest in Amazon and it's like, um, you know, a few years ago, but they're not making any money, but people would throw money at it and, and bid the stock price up. Um, in 1853, the revenues of the, all the railroads in the United States was $38 million and their debt was 153, but everybody was betting on the railroads and, and, and it paid off. They it ended up being very successful. Um, and then we got the two blacksmiths down here at the bottom. Um, John Deere started off as a tailor, a tailor in uh, Vermont. And he was, he remembered when he was a tailor that um, things went through the needles that he had worked on that had been polished, the steel needles that he had polished, that things went through those much easier than they did through the other needles. And so he's working in his blacksmith shop. And everybody that comes in, all the farmers are complaining about how the soil is sticking to their wrought iron plows. And so Deer listens and uh, over time, he takes this idea and he remembers the needle and he takes steel and he makes a plow out of steel instead of wrought iron. And then over time, he figures out the right curvature and slowly he sells one. Then the next year he sells two, then 10. Pretty soon he's mass producing plows. Cyrus McCormick does the same thing in Virginia with his reaper um, and he fails more frequently than deer does. But um, then he gets this epiphany that he's, um, his, his reapers are failing because he's using them on these hills of Virginia. And he goes to Chicago and he gets to Chicago and he sees all this flat land. And it's like, you know, uh, and so he, he takes what he has built and he tests it out on the flat land of Illinois and it works pretty darn well, much better than it does on the hills of Virginia. So on his way home, he stops by, I think it was Utica, New York at uh, a place and uh, signs a contract to mass produce his reaper. And uh, the first year he sells 40,000 of them. And uh, so there's all kinds of innovation that's happening. Um, 
native policies. Uh, we have a spectrum that goes from awful to horrific. And um, we, um, there's really not much we can say about it. Um, Andrew Jackson had been president from 1828 to 1836. Andrew Jackson had made part of his name as an Indian fighter. And um, he had been an advocate when he had been fighting the Creeks and the Seminoles in the Southeast of extermination. And uh, when he became president, he, um, he used the power of the executive branch to put his, uh, his uh, authority into use. The Creek and the Seminole, to a large degree, were annihilated or in the case of the Seminole, they were able to retreat into the Everglades and escape um, um, the, the efforts of the uh, army to uh, encircle them. Um, relations with the Cherokee were marginally better in uh, Georgia where I live part of the year. Um, I would call it a tense detente. Uh, the Cherokees had obviously their own language, had some pretty uh, stable um, traditions, cultures, et cetera. Um, and everything worked fine. And then in uh, 1835, I don't know if you've heard the term, there's golden in our hills, um, but uh, that, Phrase comes from the gold rush uh, in Georgia in 1835. And um, with the discovery of gold in Dahlonega in 1835, um, things got bad for the Cherokee very quickly. Uh, there was a treaty signed in 1837 at New Dakota, which was um, a Cherokee capital just north of Atlanta. And um, the um, American group found a willing Cherokee chieftain, a, a junior chief, if you will, who was willing to sign the treaty to um, let go of the land. Uh, he was not the head chief of the Cherokees, John Ross, and um, um, therefore, it became a, really a constitutional battle and a legal battle that played out. But um, in the end, uh, the Cherokees were removed. It was known as the Trail of Tears. It started and ended up in uh, Oklahoma, uh, Indian Territory as it was known at the time. And um, I think, I don't know, I've seen numbers, 3,000, 4,000 Cherokee that, that died as a result of the, the move to, to Oklahoma. If we could. Um, anybody know who this is? If you, there's a, it, it is, yeah, for those of you who have lived in Michigan, the name Schoolcraft or the word Schoolcraft is probably pretty familiar to you. This is Henry Schoolcraft. And um, he was uh, pretty instrumental to the story we're about to tell. And um, he um, was, well, let's go to the next slide because I think the next slide talks a little bit about him. Um, it's the name that you frequently encounter, there's a county in the UP named after him. Uh, there's, I think, streets, I think there's a company named after him. I'm not exactly sure how that company got his name, but, um, but he was born in New England. He toiled in a number of rather mean, uh, menial jobs until he was about 25. And then in 1820, he managed to hook up with a um, expedition uh, that was led by a guy named Lewis Cass. And Lewis Cass has uh, a long history here in Michigan. 
And uh, they explored uh, Lake Huron, Lake Superior, and they searched for the, the headwaters of the Mississippi River. They didn't find it. Schoolcraft went back later and did find it, but this expedition didn't find it. Um, he had been on a trip, um, I think the year before, or two years before, that had um, explored the Ozarks. And he had come to the attention of the Secretary of State at the time, John C. Calhoun, because of his, um, his uh, account that he had published of the, um, the uh, exploration of the Ozarks. And um, in 1822, um, that work with Cass and with Calhoun, both prominent Democrats, ended up helping Schoolcraft land a patronage position, a civil service position as the uh, Indian agent at the Sioux. Now, Schoolcraft was a ambitious young man. And um, shortly after he ended up there, he um, became involved with and ended up marrying the daughter of a notable fur trader and uh, whose daughter um, or whose wife was the daughter of a notable chief. And uh, so um, Schoolcraft's wife's name was uh, Susan Johnson and um, Schoolcraft published this literary digest, if you can imagine it. He published the literary digest in the Sioux that had a fairly wide audience in the East. Um, and among those people that was on his readership list was Longfellow. Longfellow um, heard Susan Johnson's stories. Susan Johnson's stories then became, to a large degree, the basis of um, Longfellow's story of Hiawatha, which uh, a lot of people didn't realize. Um, over time, I, uh, Schoolcraft was a ambitious, well-connected guy. Uh, his reputation grew, his area that he managed as an Indian agent grew. And um, um, by the 1836, he was the Indian agent in Mackinac. And um, he was the guy largely who is seen as the architect of the Treaty of 1836, the Treaty of Washington, that really created uh, this area and brought this area under um, the control of the Europeans and created really uh, the ability for Michigan to become a state. There were, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. Um, but it was a civil service job and being such, and because he was a Democrat, um, Schoolcraft lost his job as the Indian agent in uh, 1840 uh, when Martin Van Buren lost the presidency to William Henry Harrison. And uh, remember that because that kind of coincides with the time Peter Doherty got here. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, later on, Schoolcraft was um, commissioned by Congress to write a um, authoritarian comprehensive book on the tribes of North America. And uh, he started it in 1846 and he finished it in 1857. And it, I think it was six volumes by the time it was complete. Um, and uh, Susan died, I think, when she was 44. She, yeah. It wasn't Susan, it was Jane Johnson's daughter. Was it? Jane, his daughter Susan. Okay, okay, thank you. She's a published author. Okay. And it was 
Okay. And then uh, uh, after his wife died, <laughs> I, can, I can dance quickly. Uh, um, after, after his wife died, um, Schoolcraft, and I, I think this has got to have something to do with his links to Calhoun. He married the, the daughter of a South Carolina planter. And um, there was a whole series of rebuttal books to Uncle Tom's Cabin. And probably one of the best known was The Black Gauntlet. And The Black Gauntlet was written by his wife. So um, it's an interesting story here that, you know, uh, Schoolcraft just managed to, he, he had this literary bent around him always, but it's a bizarre way that, uh, that he, he got around this. If we could go on. His views on Native Americans were that, and I would like to say that uh, I think he was an American nationalist first and foremost into the end. He was an expansionist, he was a Democrat. He had a J Jacksonian perspective on Native American rights and privileges. Uh, he, was a, he was politically aligned with Lewis Cass. I believe Cass was maybe um, at least a territorial governor. He might've been the first governor of the state. Um, he certainly was one of the first senators and he was the um, uh, Democratic nominee for president in 1848. Didn't win, but he was the nominee. Um, I think Schoolcraft was largely an agent of policy implementation and execution. He knew what the goals were and uh, he went out and he tried to make those things happen. His opinions on indigenous people, I think were a little bit more advanced than a lot of the, the white people, white Europeans, but I don't think you could call him sympathetic at all. Um, he respected elements and aspects of native society, uh, but he saw the sweep of the new settlers into the tribal lands as inevitable. Um, he accepted as necessary the removal of Native peoples beyond the advancing boundaries. And he felt that officials, agents, missionaries like Peter Doherty should learn native language, customs to increase their effectiveness in dealing with the, uh, with the, the tribesmen. Um, so he, I think he was maybe better than I, I don't know. I don't, you tell me what you think about him when we get done here. Um, um, you know, yeah, yeah. Well, we can talk about it. I mean, you know, in, in 1830, Michigan was a federal territory. It had petitioned for statehood. Uh, that uh, petition was pending. The population was exploding. There were 28,000 people in 1820. By 1840, there were uh, 212,000 people. There were 30,000 in Detroit at that point. Um, Cass was, uh, was clearly the straw that stirred the drink within the state. Uh, statehood really required resolution of two sticking points. There was, uh, there was a whole issue of the Toledo Strip and uh, there had been the whole battle over the Toledo I think there was the Toledo War at one point that, where no shots were fired, no casualties were, were caused, but um, there was questions about who owned and who managed that, that part of the territory. That got resolved. Then the issue became, what do we do about all this tribal land? And what do we do with all of the conflicting claims that are out there about ownership, and debts and things of that nature. Um, the goal of the Treaty of Washington was to resolve that second sticking point. And it did. And as a result of that, in January of 1837, Michigan was able to join the Union as I think the 
24th state, I believe. This is a really bad map, which is more the result of me not being able to uh, get it uh, all onto uh, a slide. Um, but basically, anything down to Grand Rapids to the west and everything north of Mackinac in, I think, largely to the east was part of the land grant that was involved with the Treaty of 1836. I'm sorry, I don't have a better, better map uh, for you here, but um, if we could go to the, the next slide. The treaty was signed in 1836 in Washington by Schoolcraft, as well as um, representatives of uh, a number of the tribes. The key stipulations, what, what was in it for the federal government was that they got 13.8 million acres of land in Northwest Lower Michigan and the Eastern part of the UP. Uh, what the tribes received in exchange was permanent reservation land, perpetual access to hunting and fishing rights, These are my words, assimilation skills, training in carpentry, farming, and blacksmithing. And that $5,000, I believe, is an annual amount, which was probably mostly tools and salaries for the, uh, the people that were doing the work. Education support, which was largely... Um, materials for education and schools. And this was what the federal government was putting up. This is not what, there was also, a, I guess you would almost call it in today's parlance, a joint venture um, because there was a Presbyterian board piece as well. And I'm not exactly sure what the, the Presbyterian board's portion was, but, um, there was 3,000 from the, from the federal government. There was a 20 year annuity of $30,000 to the 6,500 uh, members of the tribe. And there was settlement of alleged debts to traders of 300,000. I find this fascinating that you look at who gets the money, right? And you know, there's all this, there's crumbs to the, to the uh, Native Americans and then to the traders, there's $300,000. And then there's another $30,000 to the tribal leaders over the 30 years. Um, funny thing happens though with treaties, especially with the US government. Not funny really. Um, after the leaders signed the treaty and left Washington, Congress got involved and amended the treaty. And they, the main um, modification that they made was that they reduced the permanent reservations to between five and 20 years. And actually Schoolcraft, who was sitting there said, well, I think you ought to remove them in two years. Um, and the Treaty of Washington resolved those, all of those uh, land disputes, cleared the way for the granting of statehood and uh, set up those 13.8 million acres for survey and for sale of land. So at the time that the treaty was signed, the whole nearly 18,000 acres of the old Mission Peninsula was set aside as a permanent reservation. And it was that way for about 15 years until 1852. And that's Peter Doherty. Peter Doherty was born in 1805. He graduated from college in New Jersey in 1834 and from the seminary at Princeton in 1837. 
Um, Presbyterians, like a lot of other orders, were intent on evangelizing to the Native Americans who were coming into contact with Europe or with the Europeans. Um, the church, through its board of missions and the government, each footed a portion of the cost of supporting the missions. So, in 1838, Peter Doherty arrives in Mackinac, and he meets Henry Schoolcraft, who's been up in this area for 16 years, knows the area pretty well, knows the tribes, knows the key people, knows the places to go, knows the good harbors, good places to fish, etc. cetera. Um, they scout for locations. Originally, Schoolcraft had told Doherty, look down south of Sleeping Bear. Uh, they looked there. I don't think that worked. Then uh, I think Schoolcraft suggested Bowers Harbor. That didn't, didn't go over very well. Um, then I think Schoolcraft had suggested um, um, maybe Old Mission Harbor. Um, but the Indians, I think, were over at that time, they were over at uh, Elk Rapids. And so he went to Elk Rapids and um, started to build his first mission over there um, when uh, Agosa, who was one of the tribal leaders, who was living in what is now Old Mission, paddled over. And uh, Agosa had signed the treaty in Washington in uh, 1836, was notable for his uh, top hats. And uh, um, uh, Agosa came over and said, we've got about 40 families that live over in the Old Mission area. Why don't you come over to Old Mission? We'll help you construct your mission, a place to live. And uh, they did, uh, but not in 1838. Um, in 1839, Doherty came back with an associate, John Fleming. This is when they went to Elk Rapids. Um, they looked at Bowers Harbor, uh, Agosa, we went over that. Um, Fleming's wife died and um, he left and never came back. And so all of a sudden, Doherty is here by himself. Uh, with the help of, I think the, uh, I think the interpreter was um, um, a mix of European and Indian. And then I think there was a carpenter and a blacksmith and maybe a farmer that was there too. Um, but um, um, I think they struggled. In uh, 1840, he went back east. He was still a bachelor. He came back with uh, Maria Higgins, his wife, who he'd married. And uh, Maria lived with him. They built the mission house, or they petitioned the, the, the board of missions for a larger mission house. And if we could go to the next slide, um, they built what is now the Doherty House in 1842. And um, in that house over the next 10 years, I think of the nine Doherty kids, I think five or six of them were born in uh, Old Mission. Um, of the nine kids, I think seven lived to adulthood, um, but, uh, and they all stayed and were raised in the, uh, you know, raised and educated at the mission along with the, with the native children. Um, most of the materials from the Doherty house were local. If you come to the house, you will see that um, most of the materials there are rough hewn logs. Uh, some of the wood had to be sawn in the nearest sawmill at that time was in Sheboygan. So it had to come around through the, through the straits and come down. Um, by 1851, there were 40 houses. Uh, there was stores, workshops, there was a post office. Um, there were elements of assimilation that were happening. 
uh, the natives had always, you know, been nomadic. They would head into the woods to hunt, and then there would be a period of time where they would be um, more sedentary, and they would be in their homes, their hogans, if you will, near the near the beach. Um, but they had begun to be more settled. There were 350 acres of land under cultivation near the, the mission. Um, but at this point in 1851, the reservation status was ending and they were beginning to look for what was next. And there were already uh, squatters settling on the peninsula. You know, I mentioned uh, Mr. Ladd. Well, Mr. Ladd was here in the early 1850s and uh, he didn't claim, didn't have title to any land at that point, but he was here. So uh, there were white settlers already on parts of the peninsula. And um, as the peninsula closed as a reservation, uh, there were no provisions for the Native Americans to buy the land. So they couldn't buy land where they had always lived. There were opportunities for them to do other things. If we could. So uh, while it wasn't available in Old Mission, there was land across West Bay over by Omina um, with conditions. And those conditions were kind of harsh um, because if you wanted to do, if you wanted to buy the land, you had to renounce, effectively renounce your, your tribal heritage and you had to become an American citizen. And you had to basically say, I don't want to be a member of the tribe anymore. Um, the Native Americans looked at all their options I think some of them went and looked at Oklahoma. Um, I don't think they were impressed by what they saw. Um, they didn't, I don't think any of them went. I, 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 I've asked that question and I have not heard of anybody who said, you know, um, you know that there was evidence of any of the, the local uh, tribesmen going to Oklahoma. Um, but there were some who, uh, because the Canadians had shown, especially in Ontario, a, a, a gentler hand with the tribes, um, some of the, the tribe members did move to Canada. Um, but I think more than any other of the group moved to Omina and um, purchased land over there. And I think one of the ways that they did it was um, through the use of the annual annuity. I think that they were able to do it um, by saving some of the money that they had, had um, been given over the course of those 20 years or 15 years. I, not that I know of. Um, so, Doherty and, and his group moved to Omina in 1852. Um, that made um, the peninsula now the old mission. And that's how we got the name Old Mission as opposed to uh, it being, I don't know what it was before, but um, um, we talked about the stipulation about becoming U.S. citizens. I think Doherty, you know, and we'll talk more about this in a, in a bit. I think Doherty influenced his flock in a lot of ways um, through his deeds and his words. Um, I think he, in his diary, there are a number of entries about the pernicious effects of alcohol. Um, and um, 
starting early. And then there's one, there's one, uh, there's one entry in, um, in the later 1850s where uh, he is just, for him, angry because uh, some swindlers, European white swindlers, have come to Northport and they have plied uh, a chief up there with, uh, with alcohol and they have got him drunk and they have got him to sign a, a agreement that has basically ceded a lot of the northern end of Leland Peninsula to them. And uh, that just drove uh, Doherty crazy. Um, he was a believer in thrift and deferred gratification. I think that paid off with, um, with the move uh, to Omina in the purchase of the land. Um, the education and the religious study at the new school continued under his stewardship for about another 20 years, I think until he left and, and went to a, a pastorship in um, Wisconsin that I think he stayed at until right before he died. And then again, I mentioned earlier, the seven children all grew up and were educated in the, the uh, mission school. Um, without question, there were clashes of will and culture. Uh, we'll talk about, uh, um, there were some clashes of iron will that uh, I think softened over time. You could tell early in, in his diary entries, he was just, I can't understand why they can't get with the program. And you could see him soften over time as he became more understanding. Um, uh, other entries speak to the goodness of the people. Um, there's all the, uh, there are notations about the treacheries of some of the white interlopers. Um, I don't see anything uh, in there that talks about protests to the Indian agents or to the, the, the Board of Missions about what was going on in 1852. You know, you would, I kind of would think that, you know, after being there for 10, 14 years, whatever it was, there would be something to say, come on, you know, isn't there something we can do? Um, and can you imagine if you were one of the natives and after a thousand years, what you're going through here in 14 years, you're getting, you know, we think we live in a time of rapid change. Can you imagine what they went through in 14 years? Um, and I believe that Doherty retained some level of influence given that vortex to be able to to have a, a positive impact on the people that he worked with. Um, so as we finish up, how do we assess Peter Doherty? I think history is a cruel arbiter. And I think, you know, we learn that these days because so much information is out there. Every speech, every, every letter, every, book is online now, can be searched, and, um, and everybody tends to do it now. Um, I know over the next four weeks, you're going to look at just what, uh, what that bottle that Peter Doherty uncorked has done, and I, I might come back just to just uh, just to be a fly on the wall, because I think it's going to be fascinating. Um, uh, you know, the, the continent and America itself were, were in deep flux. Uh, the government policy was clearly saying, you know, exterminate, resettle, assimilate. I, there was no option to say, hey, let's just let things go. Let's leave the status quo alone. That, that wasn't an option. Um, American policy was clearly heads I win, tails you lose. You know, there wasn't really anything else. And the religious orders were eager to spread the gospel and, and played a role, if we could go on. Uh, Doherty was human and 
He was a man, he wasn't superhuman. Uh, as a representative of the mission movement, he was probably, I think he was better than most of his peers. Um, though he's funded by the US government, the mission board, I think he was virtuous, a virtuous instrument of policy. Um, longevity speaks to his care, immersing himself in the culture, in the language as he sought to convert and educate um, and raising his own children. I think, you know, he ate the dog food. I think that's important. Um, he exemplified traits that he asked his, his followers to exhibit. Um, you know, the Presbyterian church insinuated itself to the federal government to further its aims in much the same way Doherty did with Henry Schoolcraft. But Doherty's missionary work benefited from the insights it gained from Schoolcraft. But his religious devotion, I think, prevented him from being the, you know, the full-on jingoistic nationalist that Schoolcraft was. And I think it's worth remembering that, you know, I think Schoolcraft was a mentor for him early on, but after 1841, Schoolcraft was gone. And I think that gave Doherty a lot of room to maneuver. I think he had a lot more ability to maybe do things his own way and to be able to do things that didn't have to hew to the, you know, the American government line as much. And I think that may have benefited the local population and Doherty, both. So history as a judge and jury, um, our nearly unlimited access to data provides scholarly, scholarly reviews not possible in the past. Sometimes the evolution of mores and customs have caused us to re-examine once venerated figures, you know. We used to think Thomas Jefferson was just great. You know, we don't think he's quite as great as we used to. Uh, in other cases, this examination is leading to critical reviews of period that have long been troubling and considered morally wrong. Kind of what we're going through right now. Through this prism, I think Doherty is a good actor serving in the interests of hard, difficult, no-win decisions. And I really wonder, I bet you think about this sometimes too. I bet you've had this discussion over coffee. I wonder what peccadillos we carry that future generations are gonna judge us on in 50, 100 or 200 years that you know we right now righteously think are just the right thing to do. I guarantee you, you know, I guarantee you that, you know, 50 years from now, people are gonna look at us and go, those people were crazy for letting their kids sit on computers all day. And, you know, I guarantee it's gonna happen. But, um, but you know, that, that's, how, uh, that's how history is interpreted and, uh, and it's how it lives. So um, that's it. So that was, I think that's my last slide. So any questions? Um, well, I did have a couple of pictures of the Doherty house. Um, there's a lot of questions about that. It's probably, we like to unofficially say that um, we had a role in it at the Doherty house. Truth be known, it probably started on Leona. Uh, but, but at the Doherty house, our story is that we're important because of the intersection of really three major currents of local history. Doherty, obviously, but then beyond that, um, the Rushmore era brought some of the introduction of apples and fruit to the peninsula and uh, notoriety for the fruit. And then also as the boats began to come in, and leave full of fruit, they were arriving empty and um, 
as a finance guy, tremendous asset utilization issue that needs to be solved. Um, the Rushmore's looked at it as an opportunity and the resort industry was formed and they created, expanded the house and formed one of the first resorts. There was, there was one that died, um, a, a grandchild, I think, maybe, that died a few years ago, but um, I don't, I don't think there, I don't think there are any left. We got a number of artifacts from like a nephew that were like uh, planes that you would use to, 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 fashion wood um, that we display at the house. Is there a dirty house from Avenida? In the Mina, is there one there? I don't think so. I don't think so. They had to move somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. Good question. Does so. yeah. the dirty house have any kind of a I think it's been I think there's a little bit of a relationship, but it's, um, we're, we're trying to cultivate it. Let's put it that way. We, when we had the open house, when we opened in 2019, uh, we had a number of members and we've had members come over periodically. I think we'd like to see it improve. Um, Cause it's, they're an important part obviously of the story. Well, we've run a little bit long tonight, but I want to thank Tom for, for all that he shared with us tonight. For myself, I know I learned a lot of history that I wasn't aware of, and thank you for taking some questions, Tom. Um, again, we're a little bit long. If you want to stay for discussion, we can do that. If anybody wants to discuss, I do have a couple questions maybe that might prompt that if you're interested, anybody's interested. I've also been advised that if you are going to leave or when you're leaving, there's a lot of cookies in the back that are wrapped. You're supposed to take at least one. So, all right. So um, what's your pleasure for discussion? Can I, can I pitch one question out there maybe at you and see if the group interested in engaging? So um, now based on what we heard tonight as far as history, you know, we had the racial justice working group make the statement, reckon with missional and colonial history of the land, especially Presbyterian's role, and work to build a relationship with the Native American community. Now, in the context of what Tom shared, what do you think about that statement, just generally? It's still good? Still good, okay. How do we begin? Yeah. 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 He was yeah, hopefully also maybe Mark Wilson will help us with that and Eric Hemingway. So can you please explain how you are sharing that? Sharing what? what your question <coughs> about the Native Americans with your voice here. That's the Um we're sharing it partly through this series and the publication of the series. Um other than that, I don't think we've done a lot of communication or promotional. I think it's appeared maybe in a newsletter or two. Okay. Church and our neighbors and 
other Christians, perhaps as well, you know, in our community, to begin to reckon with these questions for the sake of then discerning what, you know, to Mary's point, where we start, right? What are the next action steps for us? Um, so I appreciate the question, and I really think that the intention part is, is almost an internal one, not to be exclusive, but for the sake of not doing our own work. Any other comments, Leslie? Yeah, just in being part of other uh, racial group groups, is that that we as the European, we as the European uh, folk have to. We want to be in relationship with our indigenous brothers and sisters, but we are not ready to be in relationship yet. So the work is for us to be. And I'm just paraphrasing what. But Lucy said, is the work for us now is to ready ourselves to be in relationship, which means having an accurate self-assessment of our own history and the impositions that we have, um, that we have required for others to be in relationship to us. Uh, Any other comments or questions? Why wasn't that like these all Sorry. Next week. All right. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate you being here tonight. Yeah.